bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people that are here to hear this word, that they may be edified as saints of God. And we just thank you for a place to meet and to worship and fellowship and communion. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, what I've been doing, as you know, uh, I've been covering a, the first service as a series of trying to prove something. And uh, basically what I'm trying to prove and show you out of Acts is the... Uh, that in Acts 11, verse 20, that those people that's referred to there are not Gentiles, as some of the Grace Brethren say they are, and most everyone else, including Cornelius Stam, says they're Gentiles, but they're not. And so what I'm doing is I started in Acts chapter 1 just to give a background of what took place at Pentecost and at the, uh, the gathering up of, of Jesus Christ into the clouds on his ascension. And I'm working my way up to it just to show you what Peter James and John and the apostles were going through. We talked about Pentecost and those things. Last week, we talked about, and just to give you a quick brief on it, Peter and John, they went up into the temple at the hour of prayer. We went over the, at the ninth hour. We went over the three different time periods. And then what we did, we found out that Peter and, and, and John, were, as they were going into the temple there, that uh, they had a lame man sitting out there. And this lame man was asking for an all. And so that's where we're at today. And I want you to, if you would, go over to Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Now you've got to understand that they were in the temple. That's where the Sanhedrin is. They were in the temple. And we want to talk about some of these things today. I think you, you, know, you may enjoy this. It's, it's not just like sitting and reading Acts, which we're going to do, but we're going to talk about it. And if any time you want to comment on it, that's fine. But in chapter 4, verse 1, and as they spake unto the people. Who is they? That's Peter and John. Unto the people. The people are the, the individuals inside the temple. Okay? The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Well, that was something else. They come upon them. But you've got to understand who these people are. The priest and the captain and the and the of the uh temple, the captain of the temple. They're powers of darkness. Why is that? They have no light. They have not Jesus Christ. Remember, they went and crucified Christ. You know, and, and so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of these people, who the priests were and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees. That's important. How about going over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 22. Hold on here, because we're going to be flipping. Uh, chapter 20, Matthew 22. And hopefully I've got my references in order as I wrote them down. Matthew 22, verse 23. Now, in dealing with the Sadducees, you've got to understand about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones that wanted Christ crucified. See, they believe in the resurrection. But they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. So they wanted him crucified. They said he's performing these miracles by Beelzebub, by Satan, by the devil. So I want you to see in verse 23 of Matthew 22 about these Sadducees. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. That's all I wanted you to see. That the Sadducees do not believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in spirit. And they don't believe in anything. And they're the ones that's in charge. That's why they're sad, you see. Well, that's a good point. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Sad, you see. They're bound to be sad, but they're powers of darkness. How about going to Acts chapter 5, verse 17? I'm trying to establish who these people were. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, and it's in parentheses, which all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. So the people, including the high priest, were the Sadducees. That's who you're looking at. Now, let's keep on checking this out. Go over to Acts 23, verse 8. Just to establish who is there. You know, it's always true. Whenever you're teaching something, you learn more than what you're going to tell anybody else. And you want to tell them everything you know, and you can't remember it all. Yep. Acts 23, verse 8. 
For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So we know the Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees, which is now in charge over there of the Sanhedrin, they didn't believe in a resurrection. Okay? Now, back to where we're talking about. And as they spake unto the people, that's John, as Peter and John spake unto the people, which is the people of Israel that's inside the temple. The priest and the captain of the temple. Well, the holy priest there, we're going to talk about who in the heck that is shortly when we get on down here a little further. But the captain of the temple is like the sec second person in charge. He keeps down any kind of insurrections. You know, it's got to the point in modern day society where if you're sitting in a congregation, you're liable to get shot. Honestly, you know, that's happened. That old boy out there in the Midwest, I think it was in the Midwest, uh, that abortion doctor, uh, some fellow believer came in and blew him away. They've now passed it where uh, certain states will let people carry a weapon in the church. Is that not bad? When you can carry a weapon in, and you need it, I'll just say there's nothing wrong with if it was back in the Western days when everybody had their weapons. But usually they hung them up on the, something on the outside and they wouldn't carry them into the house of God. But nowadays, they say, well, you'll be able to carry a weapon in certain states into your church to protect yourself. My gosh. Now, let's move on. Being Verse 2. Being grieved. Who's being grieved? That's the high priest, the Sadducees, and so forth. That they taught, they is the people who... Peter and John, taught the people, which is the Jews, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. When they were preaching the resurrection from the dead, you can absolutely believe it made the Sadducees upset. Now, the Sadducees were the ones in control. They were the leaders of the church. And it's kind of strange how that works. And they, that's the, the, uh, the Sadducees, the high priest and the captain of the temple laid hands on them. They actually bound them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now evening. See, if you remember correctly, the, the council, the Sanhedrin, which has 71 members. Now, they do have different Sanhedrins for various local synagogues, and there's 23 members in those. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the big deal. In Jerusalem, they had 71 members, and it was all in a circle. And we're going to show you that in a minute. But this was evening. But you remember what they did with Jesus Christ? They didn't care if it was evening. They held court in the middle of the night. They wanted him dead so bad. Now, here's what we got. But they laid hold on him and put them in, uh, uh, actually, they probably put them in a holding tank I'll use that word, in the temple, or just adjoining to the temple. But they put them in hold until the next day. They were they didn't wait a week later. They wanted to get this stopped right now. These people were speaking in the name of Jesus Christ, but they didn't like it. They were talking about the resurrection from the dead, which they denied even happened, and they were in charge. Verse 4, how be it many of them which heard the word believed, Many of them, that's not the, the Sanhedrin, that is the people in the temple. It's called the people, the Jews. They heard the word, believed, and the number of the men, listen to this, was 5,000. Didn't say, in this case, I don't believe it's men and women and children. I believe it's men only because it, it didn't say mankind. It references men only. It didn't say the word only, but it says, and the number of the men was about 5,000. That's quite a bit. I mean, that's got to be pretty big. And it came to pass on the morrow, that's the next day, that's why they're acting in such a rush that their rulers, we're talking about the Sanhedrin now, their rulers and elders and scribes, scribes are the one that's just the brilliant kind of guys. They've been studying the doctrine of the Old Testament into depth. Now, all the Jews did that, but not into depth like the scribes did. Now, here's where we're going. And Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Well, you can see, just, you see that? And the kindred of the high priest. It's, and it's like, what do you call that? Uh, 
oh, he's a word, it eludes me, spoil system that U.S. Grant started back in the military and the presidency, where it, it, it happens all the time now, where if you get a job down at the county, you're going to hire all your relatives. That's exactly what this sounds like. It, it, it says, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. I want you to go over to, to uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 2. We're going to look at some of this stuff. This is very interesting. Luke chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 3. Nepotism. Nepotism. That's what I was, word I was thinking about. Luke chapter 3, verse 2. I, I want you to pay attention to what's happening here. Luke 3, 2. Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest. You see, both of them, it, it references being the high priest. It's plural. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. It says, it's not what I'm trying to show you. I'm showing you Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. Dual. Now, let me tell you something about Annas as before we even progress any further. Annas was the high priest. He was a Sadducee around between 6 AD, and I get this from secular history, so, it, you know, this could be wrong. But what I'm telling you is correct. I may have gotten my information from the wrong place. But history, sometimes we do use, not as scripture, and not to take as 100%. But he came into power around, he was appointed around 6 A.D. And he lasted for, I don't know, maybe around 21 A.D. But it's insignificant for years. Now, he was the guru. And you know, sometimes when you're a, a political individual, and that's what it is, when you're a political individual, because remember, these Jews, they were politically above everybody in the world, and they were religiously above everybody in the world, because they were God's chosen people. Now, here's the thing about Caiaphas, I mean, uh, about Annas. He lost his job, and then they started appointing others, but they started appointing some of his sons, and then this Caiaphas is his son-in-law, which we're going to see. So when it said the kindred, they really meant that. They really did. Now, Annas, for example, had lost his job, but he still had the status of being a, quote, ex-priest. People still loved the guy. He still had power. And that's why it references both of those guys as being priests, the high priest. Now, I want to go somewhere else here to show you a little bit more about that. Go over to John chapter 18. I just absolutely love chasing this stuff down. It, it, it's just amazing. John chapter 18. And go to verse 13. Now we're talking about Jesus here, but that's it, it's insignificant at the point. I just want to show you about Annas, in verse 13, and led him away to Annas, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now, so you can see that Annas was the older man, he was the high priest, he had lost his job, they had put other people in, including his sons, in the line, and now his son-in-law, the kindred, was there. How about going on over to verse 24? You know Annas had power, because I'm showing you in verse 24. Now, Annas had sent him, talking about Jesus here, bound. So he, this old boy had some power as an ex-priest unto Caiaphas, the high priest. So now we've already read in Luke chapter 3, verse 2, where they both high priests, but this right here specifies that Caiaphas is the high priest. But that shows you the power that Annas really, really had. There is no doubt about that. Now, in verse 7, well, before I even go there, who is this John? Well, now, John, they don't nobody know who that is. It's never referenced again in the Bible who this John is and Alexandria. It's been thought, and that's all I'll have to tell you, that, that John was the son of uh, Annas. But we don't know that. So that's just all pure speculation. But you'll never see John, this John and Alexandria anywhere else other than this right here. But I guess the, the Lord put it there to show you there were numerous people that were the kindred of the high priest, and they were all gathered at Jerusalem. 
now in verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, and when they, that's these, the Sanhedrin, had set them, that's, John, uh, that's Peter and John, in the midst, they asked. Now, what's the midst? Well, that's a circle. The Sanhedrin had 71 places that an individual could sit. They don't have it like this right here. They just had it, if we just put a circle here, and they put the guilty parties, or what they thought to be the guilty parties, in the center. And people questioned those. So they put them in the midst. They asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Done what? I want you to slip over to uh, Acts 4.16. What are we talking about? They're talking about, you mean you made a lame man walk? That's why we're here. That's why we've arrested you. You've done a great deed. But look over in verse 16. Go down to, to it where it starts right after the, the question mark. For that indeed, a note, this is what they said. We're going to get to it a little bit more. For that indeed, a notable miracle hath been done by them. Them is, you know, Peter and John. Is manifest, appeared to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. This is the sad, you see, that says there's a miracle took place and we can't deny it. Boy, that's bad when you don't believe in the resurrection and you already see it. We can't deny it. That's right here. They see the truth, and they will not take care of it. It's just like instantly, once they seen this lame man walk and be healed, why wouldn't the Sadducees, who didn't believe in a resurrection, why wouldn't they believe in that? Know what? They, are, they know the truth now because you just saw it in verse 16. But they won't change their mind because guess what? They're in power. Just like me and you were talking about with that individual while ago with the church. He's in power. He's got things going his way. That's what these, they're concerned about the here and now. They're not concerned about their everlasting life because they never believed it. But now, somebody's shown them. A lame man, you made walk. Man, you've really been disgusting. You made a lame man walk. It's been like that for 40 years. And they're brought up on charges on account of it. Now, it says, and by what name have you done this? Wow. Now, verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. If you remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They could work miracles. They could raise people from the dead. They could speak in tongues. They could do all of those things. So Peter is, and John are filled. That's who it's talking about, Peter and John. Not the rest of the people right now, just these two people. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people, you rulers of Israel, the Jews and elders of Israel. If we this day be examined of the good deed, and it was a good deed, done to this impotent man, he couldn't walk. By what means he is made whole. Now I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go up here to Luke chapter 12, verse 11 first, if you would. Luke chapter 12, verse 11. And this is what Christ was warning his disciples about. And when they bring you into the synagogues, and that's where they were at inside the temple, and they bring you into the synagogues and into the magistrates and powers. These are people that we're talking about are powers. Take you no thought of how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Don't worry about it. I'm giving you boldness in my word to speak what I want you to speak. So, that's what's happening. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Verse 19. See, they've been held. It's the next day. But this is what this is what Christ said again. But when they deliver you up, and they have delivered them up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. Now, there's other references we're not going to go to, but it's, it's talking about the same thing. Uh, now, here's what I want you to see. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. This is why I showed you those two scriptures. 
Make no thought of what you're going to say or do. Or because I'm going to give you what you need. The Holy Spirit's going to give you what you need to say. So Peter, at this point in time, he's in charge. He is very bold of what he says. He said, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, he's still preaching the murder indictment that he did in Acts chapter 2. That you, and he's pointing at him, you crucified whom God raised from the dead. That's just killing the Sadducees because they don't believe he was raised from the dead. Even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Go to Acts chapter 3, verse 13. It says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Kill the prince of life, that's what you did. But God raised him from the dead. That's what he's telling them. That's what he's telling them. Now, he's very bold. You know, when someone comes... And when we're out witnessing or if we walk up in a conversation and we're telling people how to rightly divide the word of truth or if we're just telling them the gospel, how to be saved, and somebody else comes up and says, oh, that's not right. Are you bold enough to stand there and tell them the truth, whether your job is on the line, whether your paycheck is on the line, how the boldness of Peter that was given to him by Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, don't worry about it. If you're preaching the truth out of this scripture here, go for it. If the word of God offends anybody, so be it. I mean, that's just the way it's got to be. Now, in verse 11, this is the stone. He's talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man you crucified, but God raised from the dead. This is the stone which was set at naught. In other words, rejected by you Jews, by our people, because he was a Jew of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Go over to Matthew 21. I can't believe that. Oh, you live and learn. Verse 42. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Go over to 19, Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. That's the second coming. That's at the millennial reign of Christ. You also, he's talking to these 12 uh, apostles, shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now I want to show you back over in verse 43. It talks about uh, giving to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. See, the Jews have crucified. They've set it not. And now they've rejected their Savior because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. It was there. All they had to do was trust Christ. Now, some of them did. But all they had to do was trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that it would have, all of them, and it would have come out on end. The millennial reign would have come out on end. But they didn't. They did not. I want to show you over in Luke chapter 12 who that nation is. Who that nation is. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. That nation that he's talking to, that, that have trusted, uh, I will say, that believed in the name, I, I, let me use that, that believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that Peter and John is preaching to about the lame, impotent man. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Peter's bunch and what he was preaching is now called the little flock. It's a nation separate from the nation of Israel. He, they were teaching, repent, be baptized for remission of sin. They were preaching the kingdom of heaven. The Jews, of course, 
didn't believe that. Just a few. Back over. How about going to Psalm 118? I've got that referenced. Psalm 118. Verse 22. I want to start at verse 21. I will praise thee, David writes, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused, that's what we're talking about, is become the head corn, headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord made every day. Make sure you utilize it to the fullest to his pleasure, not necessarily yours, because there are going to be sufferings and afflictions in your life. But it, whatever you do, do it in the, in the praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, other than Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Go to Matthew chapter 1. You know this, but uh, still, I, I, I like to do it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she, that's Mary, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. That's the Jews, guys. We weren't mentioned here. Save his people from their sins. That was the people in the covenants of promise. And you never were. Okay? So we're not talking about for our salvation right now. No, we're not. We're talking about what Peter and John and the twelve were preaching. But, back again, his name was Jesus. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved by, by the name of Jesus. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, and ignorant men, they marvel. So these Sadducees and the high priests and so forth, they saw these guys. They knew a little bit about their background. They knew that they were fishermen and those kind of things. They were unlearned like we are. But what we've got now, they didn't have. They had the Old Testament scriptures. We've got all the scriptures because Paul says, I filled up the Word of God. we got everything that's ever going to be written. That's wonderful. Yes, Bob? That's how people feel about us. Grace movement and everything. We're a bunch of unlearned people, dirt farmers. We, yeah. don't have, we ain't never been to seminary. I agree with you, and I think that's the problem. If, if some of the pastors had been to seminary and still preached this, then they'd have called them heretics because they're not preaching the same thing they learned at the school. Thank God Brother Moore never did go to seminary. I didn't. I don't know a grace preacher that has. I know some that's young ones that started. I don't know where they're still going. They're taking correspondence seminaries. But, but you can tell the difference in their preaching right now on what they started out as a grace preacher. You really can. There's two of them out there. And it's a major difference. But you're right. They think we're, we don't know what we're talking about. And it's not that you've got to have an education. We all need to learn how to read and write. And, and I heard it not long ago. Somebody told me, and my mom told me, it really hurt my feelings because mama finished, I think, the sixth or seventh grade. And she said, son, you got all this education. She said, I, I just, I wish I had that in. Boy, it upset me. It hurt me. You don't have to have any education to understand the Word of God because you've got to be saved to understand the Word of God. The natural man receiveth not the love of the truth. He can't understand. I don't care how many PhDs you got. Matter of fact, yesterday I was talking to my cousin and I was talking to him about that same thing. And, and oh, he come back and he had to say something. He's got a PhD in electrical engineering. He worked for the NASA space program. He's a great guy. He'll help you and give you shirt off his back, but he's lost. I can't convince him that Paul is his apostle. He don't know anything about the Bible. But they want him to teach in that Methodist church. Yes, and it's just a shame. I mean, I actually walked the aisle for Jesus in the Methodist church. Even though I was raised a Baptist and I was lost, the moment that I walked the aisle for Jesus in the Methodist church, got sprinkled, I think that's what they did to me. I wasn't in a baptismal pool. But the fact of it is, it took me one week, one week to know that I was lost going to hell. And nobody could tell me how to get saved until I tried to disprove Brother Moore, found out he was right, the rest of the world is wrong. How can that be? 
But it is. It's just like Bob said. They think we're unlearned, and we are to a point, but not once we claim Jesus Christ, trust Jesus Christ, shed blood on Calvary for our salvation. It's a done deal. You start understanding this. Are you going to understand everything in it? No. There's some things in here that I even got across this last week. I said, Lord, I prayed about it. Lord, show me the truth of this. I ain't got it yet. I, and you're going to see that. You're never going. No one is ever. Brother Moore did No one is ever going to have it all. So you learn from various different people the simplicity of the gospel. You know, remember what I said a few weeks ago. Rightly dividing the word of truth is not optional. It's mandatory for you to become to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You can be saved without knowing about it, but you can't ever come unto the knowledge of the truth. You're confused, and God is not the author of confusion. It's just wonderful how he did this. Now, they thought that they were unlearned and ignorant men, and they marveled. They looked at him and said, hmm, I've seen these guys before. Who was it? And, and they took knowledge. They, in other words, they, they took their own mind and said, well, I've seen them. And they had been with that they had been with Jesus. Knowing Jesus, they didn't understand that how a twelve year old kid could sit over there and teach the high priest back over in Luke, you remember? But the thing of it is, he did. He was the son of God, he was the son of man. But he learned himself as the man. You know, he was a little baby, he didn't he, yeah, Bob. I hate to No, don't that's what I'm telling you, this is a great time. Well you was talking about, you know, that they said things were hard to be understood. Yeah. Well, in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, now, Peter was with Paul 30 years. With Paul. <laughs> and he says right here, starting verse 15, an account of the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as to our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, and also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Hey, hey, that the That's truth? Peter. That Peter, he never did understand. Yeah, he never did. And he's with him, Bob said, for 30 years. He never did understand. He never talked about him. He his brother Paul. So. Right. Well, see, in, in Galatians chapter 2 there, when they give each other the right hand of fellowship, they went to separate people with different gospels. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's no doubt Peter, you got to remember, was baptized with, filled with the Holy Ghost. It, that tells me when Paul told him the truth because it was from the risen Savior, Peter didn't doubt it. He knew it was the truth because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He believed it. That's why he shook hands with him and said, Brother Paul, right there. And that's why he called him that. This is the truth. He didn't understand it, but he accepted the fact that God was working in a different way than what he was preaching. Absolutely. Now, but see, they, they looked and they knew this Jesus. And they knew that he was something else. And these men were with him for at least three years. Verse 14, And beholding the man which was healed standing with him, they could say nothing against him. Let's go over to Acts chapter 3, verse 11 again. Acts chapter 3, verse 11. And as the lame man which was healed, held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Yes, this man, if you'll notice back in verse 8, and he leaping up and walked and entered with them into the temple. So we know this was going on when Peter started in verse 1. They were in the temple walking. This man, this impotent man, this lame man, was leaping and praising God. And I would have been too if I'd have been impotent from birth 40 years but look here he was healed he held Peter and John oh, I ought to have my arm around I'd still be hugging and kissing them you can walk and you know I had the German measles one time for two weeks and when I got up out of bed I, I couldn't walk that was a horrible thing I was a kid but I was about 11 years old but the fact that it is I couldn't walk my muscles would deteriorate you know that didn't happen here well that may have been paralyzed well couldn't walk for 40 years he stood up, they grabbed him by the right hand, stood up, and he's jumping up and down. He didn't take no time. Uh -uh. He didn't take no time to get his muscles back into shape. And you know, I was reading about this. Luke, who wrote this, was a physician. If you'll notice various things that Luke, Luke, Luke writes, 
He specifies right hand like a doctor would because he was a physician. Ain't that something? He uses some kind of medical terms sometimes back over to where we were at. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Now, verse 15, but when they had commanded them, when that's when the Sanhedrin had commanded them to go outside of the council. Okay, we got the council going on. Y'all guys, Captain, you take them out, out of here. They conferred. They talked amongst themselves, the Sanhedrin did, saying, and we already read it, but let's do it again, saying, what shall we do to these men, Peter and John? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest. It's appeared to all of them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. They're in trouble, aren't they? They can't deny this. But it spread no further but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Okay, we're going to threaten these people when they come back in here. We're going to get that. That'll scare them to death so they won't do anything But we're going to threaten them with physical harm, maybe death. So that's what they did. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, you know, I'm telling you what. These guys were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's like, that's like telling a kid you can't have any candy when he's got it in his mouth. I mean, it, he's going to do it. But Peter and John answered, to the Sanhedrin and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken, to listen unto you, more than unto God you judge. It says, Judge you. For we cannot but speak. Oh, we've got us. Basically, he said, Well, we've got to speak the things which, you, which we have heard and seen. We've got to do it. So when they had further threatened them, that didn't work first, they tried it again, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. See, they let them go because of the people. That's what it is. For all men, now you heard that word all, all men glorified God for that which was done. All men that was there. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they, that's Peter and John, went to their own company, their own disciples. That's where they went and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, the disciples and the other apostles, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, this is a prayer here. Lord, thou art God. You've got absolute, absolute authority here. But Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage? Heathen being to me the, the Romans, the unsaved people like us at that point in time, and the people, that's the, the Jews, imagine vain things. Now this right here we're reading come out of Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, if you want to reference it. The kings of the earth stood up. This is still out of Psalm 2.1. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. That's what people have been against ever since creation. Uh, and I will say, since creation, they didn't even know about Christ at the creation, but I'm specifically speaking now, when, when John the Baptist came in and announced Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, they've been against his Christ from the very word go. For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, remember, Christ went to him, and Pontius Pilate, who washed his hands of it, he said, I couldn't find no fault of this man. Why he should be put to death? With the Gentiles, the Gentiles, yes, and the people of Israel, the Jews, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever they, thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. That's God's hand. That's God's counsel. For to do whatsoever God's hand and God's counsel determined before to be done. Through the foreknowledge of God, he saw these Jews reject his son. He saw all of this. So he had a counsel with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and, excuse me, God the Father himself. They determined what to do. Once they saw this rock, this stone, rejected. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants 
They're asking for something. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Now, that's what happened in verse 13. They spoke with boldness, Peter and John did. That's what they were praying for. Lord, you are God. Give us boldness to speak in our weakest times when we're down and we're about, we're about to get our head cut off or get stoned. Give us boldness to speak in the face of adversity. That's tough because I'm telling you, I hope I'm not faced with that. I don't think I would deny Christ, but you never know. Thank God for the sealing of the Holy Spirit because ain't no telling what we'll do. Verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, that's the Lord's hand, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They were asking the Lord to give a testation, give a testation to their testimony, the testimony of the disciples and the apostles. Lord, give testimony unto us so these people will believe what we're saying. And they asked it boldly. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. They got the answer. He didn't wait like we pray, and you got to find out five years from now, oh, he blessed you. You know, we pray. And we, are, we human beings, we're an impatient bunch. We want it right now. We have to wait on the Lord. You have to believe what you pray for is going to come to pass. Or ain't no sense in praying in the first place. You're just playing, praying blindly out there. If you don't pray, earnestly believing the Lord's going to take care of whatever your problem is. But see, they didn't have to wait. Instantly, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, he answered them right then. But if you'll notice the word shaken, you remember when Christ was crucified, that shook the earthquake. It didn't say there was an earthquake, but when the place was shaken, I'd have to say the earthquake. Okay? It's just like the Philippian jailer. The earthquake, all the doors open. Various different things like this. Now, verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. And there was no individuality here, no selfishness at all with any of these people that were there, that company, that the, 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 the people that were uh, the disciples and the apostles. They were of one heart and one soul. That's called unity. Unity. Neither said any of them that ordered these things which he possessed was his own. You know, but they had all things common. And we talked about that a week or two ago. But they had all things come, and they sold everything. And they brought it and laid it at the feet of the apostles, which we'll see further on down here. Now, the thing is, they didn't have any selfishness about them. They didn't complain that, well, uh, Harry has a, a yacht out here worth $500,000, and Bob over here, he's got a $500,000 house, and I've got a hut. And I sold my hut, and you sold your $500,000, you did too. We all bring the same amount of what we sold and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Nobody had any remorse about you or Bob that had so much money there. You didn't have no remorse that I didn't have any. That's not the whole point. We had one heart. We were with one accord. We had all things common. Basically, it was a form. I just I have a hard time with this. It is a form of divine communism. It's not like the Russian communism, red Chinese communism, but it was a commune. Wasn't like a hippie commune, but that's kind of on the order where you took everything. Everybody didn't have anything. They took it, if they had it, brought it all together, laid it at the feet of the apostles. Now, why would they lay it at the feet of the apostles instead of just giving it to them? In the hands? Because if you give it to somebody, huh? It was like an offering? No, if you lay it at the feet of the apostles, it's trying to say, look, what we have is nothing. But if you give me something up here, I can do this or whatever. Just laying down there for, for, for the apostles to hand out. To show you that worldly things mean nothing. All the worth that you have, you can't take one thing with you. Not one thing. Not one thing. Now, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Who is that? Let me bring it on in. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Great power? Yeah. They've already prayed. He endured them with boldness to speak 
of the resurrection, which has upset the, the Sadducees, which didn't believe in the resurrection. Verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Now, here's the thing with that. How many today that are preaching Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for remission of sin, they believe that that Peter preached. How come they don't go out and sell their houses and take it to their pastors and lay it down there? Because they don't believe it. Because they don't believe this part. They pick and choose what they want. It's garbage. And laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. It'd be nice. It's going to be this way. It's not that way now. But in the millennial reign of Christ, it's going to be that way. And Joseph, that's Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite in the, the country of Cyprus. Having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I want to show you something just in the next minute. How about going to Colossians 4.10 with me? I've got to do this or I won't have to wait. I might just wait till next week. But go over there right now. Colossians 4.10. See, there's always a discrepancy. Who's Barnabas? Well, I'm going to tell you, if you just read there, you've heard this, Barnabas sold everything and he laid it at the apostles' feet. He believed in what Peter was preaching. There ain't no doubt in my mind. But you know where he wound up? He wound up with a greater gospel with the apostle Paul and went out and preached that out of Acts 13, verse 2. The Holy Ghost separated Barnabas and Paul to go out and preach the gospel of Christ. Now, here's where it's at in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Who is this Barnabas? Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus. We're talking about Marcus now. Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If you come unto him, receive him. I'm talking about Marcus here. What we're trying to do is establish a little bit about Barnabas. Barnabas, it says, Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. Well, what does that mean? There's two things I think it can mean. Sister's son, Paul's sister, was married to Barnabas. That's one thing. That could be, Marcus could be uh, Paul's nephew or Barnabas' son, but I don't believe that. Marcus is sister to Barnabas. I think it's the sister of Barnabas that had, come on in, that had him, and I think it was Barnabas' nephew. Go to Acts chapter 12. I'm going to show you something real quick. This is interesting here. You know, Peter was locked up. And the angel came in. Go to verse 12. Acts 12, 12. And, and, and the angel came in and led him out, if you remember. That's the context here. And when, he just thought it was a dream. But in verse 12, and when he, that's Peter, had considered the thing, the thing that the, the angel coming and walking him out, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So Mary possibly was Barnabas' sister. Okay, so you'll have, to, you'll have to just go through that in yourself. Uh, I think we're going to finish it. We're running a little bit late. I'll go over this, over this last verse again next week. So here's what. Before, you know, just trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing that he was crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead if you've never done that. Believing that's the shed blood of Jesus Christ applied to your account. And let's take a break. <laughs>